Welcome back to the Single Dad's online podcast, Online Dad, and I am the Online Dad. It has been several months since my last podcast, and and you know, being busy and other things going on in, in not only my world, but not coming up with a good topic to discuss, because I've, I've discussed quite a few topics over the years, and I just didn't feel the need at, at, at certain points to, to kind of rehash stuff that I've already talked about. So back, uh, I believe it was December of 2021, the United States Surgeon General issued a warning that young people face devastating mental health effects as a result to challenges by their generation. And what that's saying is that we are worried about our kids because they seem to be experiencing lack, uh, experiencing things uh, that are causing them to do things like take guns into schools and um, hurt themselves or others. And we'll all say to ourselves, you know, no kidding. And the and the Surgeon General kind of even includes the whole Corona pandemic as one of those crises that are causing this. And I'm going to tell you, as somebody who's been talking, being an advocate for uh, children and families and single dads for the better part of 40 years, this has been going on a lot longer than the coronavirus. And for whatever reason, we tend to turn a blind eye to it. So when you experience an emotional trauma, parents get divorced, mom or dad dies, to something to that effect, in the grand scheme of society and the world where we've got people using guns to shoot people, we have a lot of violence going on, uh, kids not being able to handle uh, negative things that are going on in their world, and taking other measures to uh, learn how to cope with that loss, and they're usually negative measures, it tends to turn a, turn a blind eye. We have to wait for it to get to a mass shooting. We have to wait for it to get to uh, an extreme or a permanent solution to a temporary problem for us to take note. When in reality, emotional trauma, when you throw the grieving process in there and we acknowledge that the grieving process is a necessary tool to work through a lot of the negative things going on in our world today, You'll see a reduction in those extreme things. You'll notice a reduction in gangs and guns and bullying and drugs and you know um, mental illness, you know progression, progressive mental illness, um, you know poverty. You're going to see changes in that if we take the time now to look at that little incident, mom and dad getting a divorce, or that little incident that mom or dad was deployed or incarcerated or deported or became an absent parent. Even adoption has issues rooted in emotional trauma and why there's always uh, that two discussion over, do you tell your children you're adopted? Do you not tell your children you're adopted? And that's a whole uh, discussion for another time. What I'm saying is those little things in the grand scheme of society really are big things. You put a grain of sand in an oyster and it stays there, okay, it's going to continue to build up to an object that needs to be removed out of that oyster. Call it a pearl and it may seem like a positive thing, but what the, the, the analogy I'm trying to make is that little grain of sand now becomes something much larger. And that's where unresolved trauma and grief come from. So I'm going to start by saying it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the uptick in mass shootings in schools, public venues, or in the workplace. In addition to violence on others, according to the 2021 USA General Statistics, suicide rates are up by 3.4% from 2020 to 2021. Kind of supports that Surgeon General statement about COVID. Suicide is the third leading cause of death in ages 15 to 24 year olds. And as I said earlier, the press and government and society seem to blame a lot on the guns, the gangs, the bullying, the drugs, the extreme mental illness, uh, poor upbringing, the list goes on. While there are uh, legitimate explanations of why this type of violent outcry exists, much of the list I just mentioned could actually be symptoms to a greater problem. So if you do some digging, emotional trauma coupled with not being allowed to grieve the loss from that trauma not only impacts everyone emotionally, but also developmentally. 
okay, stay with me, by allowing and supporting a person to grieve a loss will help in developing coping and help developing coping mechanisms and working through much of their loss by grieving. Without the grieving process and teaching of coping mechanisms will set all human beings up for potential failure as grief impacts emotional stability and impedes a person to live productive, proactive lives from not making the athletic team, didn't get the part you wanted in the play, getting fired from a job, someone close to you dies, parents get divorced, an absent parent or a natural disaster all have roots um, in creating emotional trauma. It goes without saying everyone will experience at least one or more types of emotional trauma in their lifetime. And I guarantee it'll be more than one. Unfortunately, the ability to grieve is not as simple as you may think. Each emotional trauma is personal, which makes it hard to determine the level of emotional pain a person will feel when they experience an emotional trauma. And, you know, the adage tends to be is the closer you are to the situation, the more the emotional trauma will impact you. But again, everybody's different and that level of grief is different. The plain and simple fact is you cannot ignore or dismiss grief and the process to work through that grief. Our society, especially in America, uh, feels grieving is a form of weakness. It should be suppressed or treated with some sort of medication or pill. Fortunately or unfortunately, grieving is needed for a person to be emotionally healthy and in turn be physically and psychologically healthy for both uh, uh, children and adults. Most people, especially children and teens, lack the experience and tools to properly grieve and cope when things go wrong in their world. Many parents think because they see their children playing or they're laughing or they're acting like nothing is wrong that they're not impacted by, by their loss. I'm telling you, they are impacted. Even the most amiable of divorce will have a negative impact on your children if they are not allowed to grieve. If they're not allowed to grieve, they will become emotionally unbalanced and risk additional harm, not only to themselves, um, harm to their choices they make and others that they encounter. And the grief process, no, you know, nobody wants to do anything that's going to hurt. You know, we all don't like to go to the dentist because we don't like the drill. We don't like the needles. We don't like the pain. But, but at some point, that pain is going to overwhelm it and overwhelm you and you've got to get that tooth fixed. So you endure the pain of the needle and the picking and the filling and everything that you're doing so you can feel better. Grieving is similar. You have to work through the grieving process so you emotionally feel better. Then you'll physically feel better and you'll psychologically feel better. And then society will feel better. Keep in mind, it's not just personal choices. The workplace is impacted by emotional trauma. Grieving or grief impacts a person's ability to properly function at work. According to trainingindustry.com, grief is costing businesses nearly $75 billion a year due to lost productivity, lost wages, uh, mistakes being made, poor performance, and, and taking additional paid time off or arriving to work late or having to leave early. According to some estimates, that cost can grow as much as $100 billion a year. Even if your employee seems to be moving forward in their job, if they have children, they're also trying to help their children work through that emotional trauma and grief, which creates an additional impact because they, they can't stay focused at work. Um, they're taking additional time off to help their children. It affects the company's bottom line. And then you either, the company either ends up laying off or terminating that employee because of uh, poor job performance. And then that already adds to an already stressful uh, uh, situation, not only to that employee, but to their family because now they no longer have a job. By having proactive programs in place to help employees cope, their families cope, ultimately that's going to increase productivity and it's going to be a positive factor in your company's bottom line. So it's just not the family or the personal issues. It is uh, companies trying just to operate day to day. Emotional trauma on children often has a greater impact, especially in the long term. 
When a person cannot find a way to work through their emotional trauma, they tend to find themselves uh, find ways to distract themselves from that emotional pain. And most young people, and even adults too, you know, alcohol or drug addiction tends to be the two big things that most tend to look towards uh, to feel better. Now, another example, if you watch some of these reality TV series like Intervention or Hoarders, the backstory of the person featured in that episode is often rooted in the past of unresolved emotional trauma. Often that featured person experienced that emotional trauma at a very younger age. Mom or dad died, parents got divorced, something happened to a brother or sister, some sort of natural disaster, disaster, something happened at a younger age. And it went unchecked. It went unresolved. So by the time you get to these television episodes of Intervention and Hoarders, it could uh, that unresolved trauma just it grows and festers and grows and festers. So by the time it's addressed as an adult it can come, become nearly impossible for someone to recover from those addictive behaviors. And I'm not saying it can't happen, because it does happen. People do be, are able to work through that trauma and able to move forward. But at some point, if it goes unchecked, it could lead to a point of no return no matter what you try and do. There's a theorist out there. His name is Jean-Claude Piaget. Back in 1936, he developed the theory of cognitive development. And in that theory list, four concepts of adaption or adaptation. Being able to adapt to, a new, to new information about the world is a critical part of cognitive development and emotional stability. So look at it this way. Um, now, let me continue with Piaget. As human beings, we need to find balance in our lives. To have that balance, we rely on past experiences to adapt or assimilate to new experiences that we encounter, especially those negative ones. When we can't adapt or simulate to a, a negative situation or something that's, that we've never encountered before, uh, sometimes we turn to other possible harmful behaviors to find that balance. So let me give you a quick example. Through life, we carry an imaginary backpack. And in that backpack, we put all the experiences that we've encountered in our world. So when something comes up new that we haven't been able to look at before or maybe never encountered before, we dip into that imaginary backpack of experiences and we try to adapt or assimilate one of those experiences to what we're working through now. And with children and young adults and teenagers, they lack a lot of those experiences to be able to adapt or to assimilate to those um, situations. Because when you adapt and simulate uh, uh, other past experiences to something new, you're learning to cope with the new situation because you have something similar that might work. And then what happens is then you take that new experience and how you adapt it and assimilate it to it, pop that in the backpack for the next experience. But those negative behaviors have a long-term unhealthy impact on themselves, others, and ultimately societies. Which means is, if we don't do something about it, if we don't find a way to, to teach coping mechanisms and allow them to grieve and to adapt and assimilate uh, other experiences to what they're going through now, the, the long-term unhealthy impact on themselves, others, and society is just, it, it's out of this world. It's like an ink, a pen exploding in that imaginary backpack and covering everything with ink. If you don't get the pen out of there and you don't get it cleaned up, it's going to ruin just about everything in that backpack. Now, there are other theories out there that support the need for emotional, uh, to, to be emotionally healthy and to make proper and proactive choices. But the, a simple example if things, um, how about this? We do this out of anger. We punch a wall, throw something at a wall, and it breaks. Uh, we get into a verbal or a physical fight. When you're no longer angry and you look at your actions caused by your anger, there is deep regret for those choices. When you have unresolved emotional trauma and you're not allowed to grieve, you never stop being angry. You're just, you're always angry and it continues to fester and build and anything that comes into your orbit, there's a reason for you to be angry at it. Emotional trauma is just like that. A per person will continue to make negative choices because they cannot work through the emotional pain, usually because they don't know how, um, they feel they cannot grieve for whatever reason, 
or a person may have experienced multiple losses and has no direction on how to even start grieving. A lack of emotional stability has long-term negative impacts on our children and society. I, it's, it's a common statement I've been making throughout this podcast. It's just, it, it's, it's there. Emotional stability has long-term negative impact on our children and society. According to Minnesota Psychological Association, in an article they posted on their website uh, August 4th, I think it was 2022, a uh, person by the name of Jared Brown, it was called Father Absent Homes, Implications for Critical, I'm sorry, Implications for Criminal Justice and Mental Health Professionals. So their website, MS, I'm sorry, mnpsych.org, minnesotapsych.org, have implications that emotional trauma from absent parents, in this case, absent fathers, it's a single dad's podcast, impact children from the perspective of various adverse outcomes rooted in that emotional trauma. According to the posted articles, the adverse outcomes are perceived abandonment, achievement issues, I'm sorry, attachment issues, child abuse, childhood obesity, criminal justice involvement, gang involvement, mental health issues, poor school performance, poverty, homelessness, and substance abuse. These adverse outcomes not only impact the individual, but also society. For example, the article states, and I quote, Coming from a fatherless home can contribute to a child having more emotional problems such as anxiety and depression. The article continues, fatherless children may start to think that they are worthless than, than children, their peers, that have fathers. This may lead to an increased risk of suicide and or self-injurious behavior, unquote. Unfortunately, absentee parenting is not going to stop. Even if we reduce divorce and increase active parenthood from one or two households, children will continue to lose one or both parents through illness, accident, natural disaster, bad choices. We can, what we can do is recognize that emotional trauma is real and will not go away without consistent support to allow children to grieve develop those coping mechanisms, and integrate that emotional trauma into those coping mechanisms that will help their children be more resilient, improve their self-esteem, and be more proactive as teens, young adults, and in turn, adults. See the pattern? Help the children, help the teens, help the young adults. They become healthier adults. They make healthier choices, which gives us a healthier impact in our society. When they're adults, those coping mechanisms that they learn are passed on to their children for their imaginary backpack or others that they encounter. So it's just a domino effect that that positive impact, just like the negative impact is causing what we're seeing now by allowing a child to grieve, teaching them coping mechanisms, uh, allowing them to express how they're thinking and feeling in a healthy manner. They're going to take those same experiences and when their children are experiencing uh, emotional trauma, they're going to be able to pass those coping mechanisms on to them as well. So we have a healthy child, and we have a healthy adult, and then it expands into a healthier society. We are seeing what happens when we deny the grieving process and not develop coping mechanism continue to add to an already violent history to become more violent. There are plenty of examples of mental health issues that are not related to some of the very public acts of violence we've been hearing on the news. However, there are just as many that have experienced an emotional trauma that has never been resolved. Depending on the severity of the emotional trauma, when left unresolved, manifests itself to those destructive behaviors and the ones that I listed earlier. But you can any destructive behavior that destroys you mentally, emotionally, or physically – or others, that is a destructive behavior. Often, emotional trauma is either swept under the carpet and treated with medication. Treating symptoms rather than the cause is simply kicking that can down the road. As the years pass, that unresolved emotional trauma turns into, quote-unquote, that can, into an emotional, quote-unquote, boulder that cannot be kicked because it's entangled in layers that have become so hardened by other negative encounters and tarnishes everything in, in someone else's experiences. You can kick a can because it's empty and it can move. can't kick a boulder. You have to peel that boulder apart. you got to peel it apart so it can be movable. 
So as I go back to the uh, um, experience with the pen leaking all over the uh, all, all over a backpack or a purse, same thing with this boulder. That pen is leaking to one's pocket or purse. It covers everything, and it's difficult to clean. But if we take care of it right when it happens, that 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 can that pen is not going to have as much negative impact as you may think. In the aftermath and continuation of COVID-19, the grief process is just as important now. Yet many still find it as a form of weakness, uh, blame, and vulnerability. Grieving is time-consuming, but does not stop you from moving forward. I'm going to say that again to you. Grieving is time-consuming, but doesn't stop you from moving forward. However, if you choose not to grieve or to ignore what you're thinking or feeling, can stop you from moving forward. All right, I want to give you a quick example of that. So when your parents get divorced or a parent has died um, or you experience a national disaster and all of that pain that you're feeling and all that emotional that you're feeling all justified and needs to be worked through. But when you're allowed to grieve and you're allowed to process what you're thinking and feeling in a healthy manner, the next time you remember that experience, whatever that is, it's like watching a rainstorm behind a window or behind glass. You see the storm come in, you hear the thunder, you might see the lightning, you might even hear the rain pelting the window, and you see the branches all moving from the violent winds, but you're not getting wet. That's how you know that you're working through your emotional trauma. Some say working through grief and emotional trauma is a lifelong process, and it very well may be. I always say the more personal the trauma or more how, how, how close it hits you really warrants how long you continue to work through that loss. Now, if you can relive that emotional trauma like it was yesterday, that's like saying there is no window. That means you're not processing that loss. You're not working through that grief because you're still getting wet. You're still feeling the full impact of that emotional trauma. Now, there are triggers that will reopen that pain uh, to that loss. You know, holiday time, going to the cemetery, um, a smell, a sound, something. Yeah, you know what? That happens, and that's part of, as you work through the grieving process, those will happen from time to time. We kind of relive what you went through. But that's usually temporary. It's not an ongoing thing. If you can get up each and every day and remember that loss, like it happened 15 minutes ago, then you know you're not working through your emotional trauma. Grieving is a natural part of loss. Even when that loss is close to the heart, despite all the brain research, the books, the experts telling us that grief is a natural process and we must work through our grief, most still want a quick fix via the pill, denial, and suppression. Today's society often does not allow for proper grieving. Keep in mind, a loss under the best of circumstances is still a loss of a way of life. The ending of something that was of a known security. The support system and change, which all human beings tend to resist. We are all creatures of habit and we tend to resist and deny change. The old adage, you know, uh, change is inevitable, growth is optional. So when you're not growing from that change, you get stuck. If a grandparent, an older aunt or uncle passes away, parents seem to be more tolerant of the grieving process uh, for themselves and their children as a natural progression of life and tend to be more supportive and patient for that grieving. However, if that trauma is due to a more direct loss, such as the divorce um, or a, a parent abandonment or an addiction or something that the parent has caused, caused telling their children... Um, they were adopted or their spouse had died, you know, the parent has died. Parents tend to feel that their children's grief is a negative reflection on them as parents for their child's pain and heartache. And we all know, we don't, the last thing we want to do is be the reason why our children are not happy. But you know what? As parents, we're going to do things going to make our children unhappy. And then when we get to emotional trauma, like mom and dad getting divorced or, or mom or dad dies or loses a job and you have to sell the house and move it into an apartment, we don't want to take that blame. We don't want to feel that we're the ones causing our child's heartache. So what parents do is deny their children's pain 
if they see them you know, laughing or playing or carrying on like nothing's wrong and or choose to preoccupy them with distractions, gifts, activities, to admit that their children's hearts are hurting and broken, kind of an out of sight, out of mind. And then they can say, well, look, my kids are fine. You know, they were sad, you know, for a while, but look, they're all playing, they're all doing this. Okay, there's nothing wrong with distractions. There's nothing wrong with gifts. There's nothing wrong with activities, but not as a permanent substitute for the avoidance of grief. To pretend that nothing is wrong, dismiss their pain or tell yourself your tell your tell yourself or tell your children, hey, that's life. You gotta move on. Um, not gonna help you or your kids work through your grief any faster. If anything, it will take longer because there is a lack of an ability to work through the grief process, especially in children. Children are afraid that they may hurt their parents further and if they tell them, if they tell them how they feel. You would never deny your children their medication to keep them healthy. healthy. So I'm not sure why you would deny your children the ability to grieve. To allow grieving keeps your, you and your children emotionally healthy and in turn become healthier both physically and mentally. Brain research has proven time and time again that if you're not healthy emotionally, you are not going to be healthy physically or mentally. As mentioned, children, we lack those experience and tools to work through what they're thinking and feeling. So it's even more important as parents that we guide them through it. Okay? Even if your kids know others that have gone through similar circumstances, adults, we all know people that have gone through divorces and have lost their spouse or someone close to them, but no one feels their pain like they do. Nobody feels your pain like you do because their, your pain is unique and personal to them. Think about the pain you felt when you lost someone close to you or even when your divorce was final or your spouse had died. You're an adult. You have life experiences, but yet your pain has made you feel helpless, vulnerable, almost childlike all over again. And if you, the parent, the adult, have those feelings, imagine how your children who have little or no experience, life experiences must feel. An endless black hole, something hopeless. Regardless of why the loss occurred, the blame and guilt can consume you to the point of long-term denial for yourself, your children, nor can you simply feel that a few months of grieving uh, and a short-term support system is all you need. The deeper the loss, the longer it's going to take you to grieve. Since the grief is personal, seldom can a timeline be placed on it. Some say grief is a lifelong journey. If you don't learn anything on that journey, the outcome is going to be filled with animosity, anger, self-loathing. In the long term, the end of the journey is never good. It is easy to ask your children how they feel about their parents no longer being together. It's never easy. Who wants to have that discussion? Because you know where it possibly could be going. But even if you uh, did ask them and they said, oh, they're fine, or simply shrugged their shoulders, or doesn't mean they're okay with it, just they don't know how to respond to it. They don't know if they're, you're setting them up for some sort of confrontation because they don't know. They have all these feelings inside and they're not sure what they think or feel about them. Often the reality of that loss doesn't set in until six months or even a year after the emotional trauma takes place. This usually coincides with family and friends stop coming around on a regular basis to give you that support to help you and the family, or you move to a new home or a state. Right? Um, even with these, we'll take the most recent, uh, well, I shouldn't say most recent, we'll take uh, Highland Park uh, shootings on the 4th of July of last year. You know, the press goes away, the support system, oh, we're going to have counselors at the schools, they start to go away. Once they go away, that's when they really need the support. That's when they need the help because there's nobody there to support them anymore. So now they're left with their own devices of continuing thinking and feeling. And six months of grieving, when you have experienced something like that, usually is not enough. As your child gets over, older, their perspective will change. And again, may need to grieve from another perspective. You know, children, young children, are very concrete in their thoughts and their feelings. You know, kind of a light switches on, light switches off type mentality. So I try to explain that somebody has died may be difficult for a child because they don't understand what that really means. So 
as they grieve as a child, when they become an adolescent, there may be other questions or scenarios that pop in their head and they may need to reprocess that loss from a different perspective. But the difference is your children have uh, already grieved and develop coping mechanisms. So if there's a new round of grieving because they're, you know, uh, you know, an event, a graduation or something, and that mom or dad is not there, that next round of grieving may take less time to work through. Because if you don't grieve, the next emotional trauma may compound on the previous emotional trauma, that other loss, that previous loss. So perhaps making it seem even more hopeless. And it's the same thing. You keep getting bogged down with negative after negative after negative after negative um, uh, influence. It becomes more and more hopeless. At the end of the day, to grieve, whether you're an adult or child, is going to take time. How much time it takes is, is truly unknown. We, we will probably never know how long grieving takes. We just, we just don't have it. And we, as a society, we want a beginning and an end. Okay, I got to grieve for six months and then I'll be fine. It doesn't work that way. And I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings and I'm sorry if that, uh, you don't believe that. But it's there. I mean, my mom passed away 10 years ago. And there are some aspects of her not being around that still bother me to this day. So which tells me I still have some grieving to do. Am I in the same place I was the day she passed away? Absolutely not. Same thing with my dad. When my dad passed away in 20, uh, 2002, um, you know, there are still aspects of my father's loss that still bother me. But I am not where I was when he passed away 22 years ago. That's how I know that I am working through that loss. Simply understand. Just can't put a time limit on it. Don't put a time limit on it. Even if it frustrates you as an adult that your kids keep talking about it, that means they need to talk about it. Part of raising children is to teach them to cope with life's bumps in the roads. Those bumps may be caused by us, the parents, and we must be prepared to help our children cope with those bumps also. Choosing to do nothing and denying the pain will simply cause greater issue and perhaps greater heartache for you and your children. I know um, if a speeding bus was coming towards your children, you'd do anything in your power to prevent your children from being hit by that bus. Grief and emotional trauma is a speeding bus, and you can't ignore it. You can't just stand out in the middle of the street thinking it's going to stop or turn away. So what I've done is kind of created a punch list to help you and your children start that grieving process in a healthy manner um, with some basic steps. Now, I'm not saying you need to do every every single one of these steps in order to properly help your children grieve. Every family dynamic is different. Every situation is different. You may have tried some of these already with or without success, but I would say start with one. And if that one worked, maybe go on to another. But you know your family better. But I wanted to give you some basic steps, especially, especially dads or any, in some cases moms. If you don't have a, a residency with your children, you're only seeing them every other weekend or a couple times you know, during the month or whatever the visitation is, you want to make sure that you don't deny that grieving process just because they're with you for a short time. So uh, point number one, when talking to your children, all technology is turned off and put away. No distractions. Don't put it on vibrate. Don't shut it off. Okay, that, if that means shutting your router off, um, putting them in a basket in another room off, get rid of all the technology. No TV, no music, no nothing. Put it away. No distractions. Acknowledge the loss and validate their feelings. And sometimes that often starts with sharing your own feelings. When children don't know what to expect or they don't want to be vulnerable, they may not respond to anything you're saying. But if you start with your own feelings age appropriately, of course, then you're going to find that the next conversations coming down the road may lead to something a little more productive. So even that first time you sit down with your kids and talk about what they're thinking and feeling about mom and dad not being together or mom or dad dying or grandma, grandpa passing away, you may get shrugged shoulders. You may get, I'm fine or, you know, it is what it is. Start with your own feelings. Well, let me tell you how I'm feeling about it. And again, keep it age appropriate. Next point, remember, crying is okay and it's healthy. Have a box of tissues just in case. And I'm not saying every time you have this conversation, it's going to turn into um, a crying session. But it it is going to happen. It is going to come up. It's a way to express what they're thinking and feeling. And it's healthy. And mom or dad, I'm going to tell you, it's healthy for you to cry in front of them also.
Next point. Make time to discuss their world and the impact the loss is making on them. Okay? You can say, and you can say to them, well, i got to work and I've got to pay bills and I've got to keep a roof over helping clothes on your back and keep you educated. That's not their world. That's your world as a parent. So you need to discuss the impact on their world. Okay, loss of friends or moving to a new state where you were, you know, you were happy, not being in your childhood home because you can't afford it. You've got to turn it into how it impacts their world and how they're feeling about it. When you have these discussions, don't set a time limit and facilitate the discussion. Don't run it. Don't guide it. Don't try to make them feel a certain way. You've got to let the process go. Now, if you get to a point where you have to end it for whatever that reason is, Okay, and try and end it on an upbeat note and a promise to continue and please make sure you continue. And that upbeat note can mean we're going to be fine. I love you no matter what. Um, I'm here if you ever need me. Keep it on an upbeat note and promise it will continue. Reassure your children that you will be there to help them every step of the way. And again, perspective from your child, uh, uh, their, their realm, their world. So while you might not think it's that big of a deal that something had popped up and it's bothering them, you want to reassure them that you're going to be there to help them with way. And I'm not saying helping is necessarily you fix it for them, but again, facilitate what they're thinking and feeling and help them come to a way to cope and guide them through it. Next point, understand your children's time to talk may not be convenient. They may wake you in the middle of the night. They may walk in on you while you're on a Zoom call or on the phone. You have to understand that that's going to happen. If you absolutely cannot stop what you're doing when they want to talk to you, you tell them when you'll be available. You know, give me 15 minutes, give me 10 minutes, give me one hour. I got to finish the Zoom call and you have my undivided attention. Okay? You have to make sure that um, you go back to them. Don't dismiss it or forget about it because then they're going to take that as what they're thinking and feeling is not important. All right. When you're having these conversations, they may do very little talking in the beginning, but they are listening to you and they are watching you. Maybe not so much listening and watching as you're having this discussion, which they are, but how you're reacting to things going on in daily life, how you're handling another negative thing. That's why I always say to to, uh, parents, do not talk negatively about your ex-spouse in anywhere where your kids could hear you. Because they're listening and watching. You may want to consider counseling or peer support group for your children. We all tend to rely on our peers as a sounding board for things that we're thinking and feeling. Children are no different. Sometimes they have the attitude of, how does an adult know what I'm thinking and feeling? The adult is the one who caused the problem to begin with. So sometimes a counseling or some sort of peer support for your children would be beneficial. Sometimes peer support is not necessarily counseling. Counseling, it's letting your children be in a group of kids that have gone through similar situations. Because believe it or not, even though they know mentally in their head that they know other uh, peers that have gone through a similar situation, but sometimes when they're in that group and they hear the stories mirror what they're going through, um, is it does a world of good. Because sometimes you need to be a third party out there helping them work through it. So consider that. One peer support group is called rainbows.org, www.rainbows.org. And that's one form of peer support. Go to the website, make a phone call. They can tell you if there's a site in their area. Um, Next point, parent your children consistently with appropriate boundaries. Don't parent out of guilt um, because that tends to have negative long-term effects on your children. Next point, feelings are neither good nor bad. They just are. It's how you express those feelings that need to be monitored. Never dismiss their feelings, even if they are angry at you. Don't dismiss it. They need to be able to work through it. Again, it's not the feelings. It's how they're expressing the feelings. Next point, they need to verbally express themselves and may not know how. So that occasional swear word might pop out or they don't know the proper words to say it. You have to give them permission to be able to verbally express it as they think they can do it, all right? Um, When you listen more than give a reason or excuse for why something has happened, it's not always going to work. You need to be empathetic. Pity and sympathy usually don't work, especially with adolescents. 
So listen more than give a reason or an excuse for why things happened the way they did. Be empathetic. Next point. Conversations with younger children may be limited. And you may need to ask them to draw what they're thinking and feeling while explaining it uh, to you the best they can. Because they don't have those verbal skills uh, as a teenager may or even a, a young adult may. Okay, last point. Tell them each and every night you love them and reassure them that you're in this together. That's all a child wants is to know that they are supported. And you want to make sure that regardless of how that conversation ended, whether it was negative or they blamed you, even if they blamed you for what happened, you have to reassure them that you love them no matter what they're thinking and feeling right now. No one ever said parenting was easy. And adding an emotional trauma such as a divorce, a death, a pandemic, deployment, incarceration, deportation, any of that makes parenting more difficult. Anything worth doing is going to be hard. So regardless of how hard parenting is or becomes, your children are counting on you. When tackling grief, try to break it down into chunks. Sometimes looking at, the, uh, looking at grief as a long-term process can be very overwhelming. If you chunk it, the process can be made a little bit easier, but um, I should say easier and more manageable. Probably manageable is the better word. It'll make it a little bit more manageable. Not only are your children depending on you, um, so is society. Because again, healthier children become healthier adults and healthier adults make a healthier society. We can make society better, one healthy child at a time. Being able to grieve will make, a health, will make for healthier children, then they become healthier adults, they make healthier choices, and then society becomes healthier with a reduction in crime, homelessness, addiction, violence, etc. So I'm going to end it there. Please go to my website, www.singledadsonline.org. Leave some comments of strategies that may have helped you work through this process or topics that you would like to uh, me to address in the future. Remember, your children love you unconditionally. You are an awesome dad. And just remember that no matter what you do and how you do it, as long as you are in your child's life proactively, they are going to love you unconditionally. Have a great day.